Uh, all right, Judges chapter 8. If you haven't got a Bible, get a Bible. Judges chapter 8. We're going to do uh, 35 verses in this chapter. We're going to try and fly through all of them, okay? Um, it's a lot. There's a lot going on, but it kind of ends with Gideon being finished, the whole account of Gideon being a judge. But we'll go and jump right here. This is the last section of Gideon, as I said, 8.28, we finish off with Gideon, and we jump through to our next section after that. Well, you notice there's a gap here from chapter 8 to chapter 10. Chapter 9 is a kind of questionable chapter we'll get to next week, but we're going to go through this. Um, it's following from last week. Remember we talked about Gideon, and he went um, and he spied, and then he called on people to come up for war, and now they're having the people come up, and they did their whole... Uh, Bring them down from 30, uh, 32,000 to 300, and they fought everyone. It was, it was epic. It was good. So now they're chasing after the remainder of the Midianite army, and we're going to see what happens next. If you've read ahead, no spoilers, okay? Don't yeah. no spoil it for everyone. But we've got our section. Section one is the Ephraimites are offended. <gasps> you offend me, sir. Verses 1 through 9. And the men of Ephraim said unto him, Why hast thou served us thus, that thou callest us not? When thou wentest to fight with the Midianites, and they did chide with him sharply. And he said unto them, What have I done now in comparison of you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? God have delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb, and Zeb, and what was I able to do in comparison of you? Then their anger was abated towards him when he said that. And Gideon came to Jordan, passed over. He and the three hundred men that were with him faint, yet pursuing them. And he said unto the men of Succoth, Give, I pray you, loaves of bread unto the people that follow me, for they be faint, and I am pursuing up to Zeba and Zalmunna, kings of Midian. And the princes of Succoth are, are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in thine hand, that thou shalt give bread unto thine army. And Gideon said, Therefore have the Lord have delivered Zeba and Zalmunna into thy hand, and I will tear your flesh with the fawns of the wilderness, and with briars. And he went up thence to Penuel, and spake unto them, and likewise the men of Penuel answered him as the men of Sackoth had, had answered him, and he spake also, also unto the men of Penuel, saying, when I come down in peace, I will break down this tower. Okay, already we've got people being offended by not being allowed part of the glory. We've got people saying no, because you haven't provided the results that we're looking for already. And we've got Gideon basically saying, hey, because of your answer, I'm just gonna wreck your lives. I'm just gonna kill you or torture you, it's brutal. But we're gonna see this in verses one through three, we're gonna get Ephraim's complaint and Gideon's answer, okay? Remember last week we read that God lessened the army of Gideon, numbers went down and the army remained that God wanted to use, down to 300 people. And then the men of Ephraim were frustrated. They got sent to go, and they came back. Then now like Gideon's come to their land and saying, hey, I need, I need help now. You need to feed people, you need to look after people, I need you in my army, or I need you to be ready. And they basically tell Gideon off. They tell him off. They reprimanded him sharply, right? And it's funny, they did chide with him sharply. The men of Ephraim joined in the fight when Gideon called them out to them, hey, come and help, come and help, come and help. Then they were upset that he didn't call, that Gideon didn't call them to join in right when the battle started. When he like put the numbers out and then God like brought the numbers down, those are the people that left, right? And it's funny because you get to see why people want to be involved in these type of things. Wow. This shows uh, the desire of man's heart, okay? Why they want to be involved. Men of Ephraim uh, seem to care more about recognition than the overall good of Israel. They wanted to be recognized. They wanted to be part of the glory. Instead of being um, involved and like wanting to be part of that, they should have just recognized that God's people needed help. God's people needed to be rescued, and that's who God was going to use in that time. What's funny about that is sometimes we hear people do this in our, in our lives now. You hear of really good, uh, good stories of people coming to know Jesus. Hey, I've been working with this person for so long and they finally accepted Jesus into their lives. And that person's like, oh, I wish I was involved in that. And you're going to, didn't, didn't you hear about the cool part of them accepting Jesus? Yeah, but why, why wasn't I asked to be involved? Like, you're missing the point completely. Mm -hmm. The point here isn't that you're not involved. The point is that this guy, and this is what happens here. Men of Ephraim are upset that there's this glorious moment, a big battle that happened. And actually, you didn't let us come play? I'm really upset about that. 
So the tribe of Ephraim would have actually, they're one of the tribes that would have benefited hugely because of this defeat. Okay, they would have benefited hugely because they were a neighboring tribe. But the thing they were upset about was the fact that they were not involved in the glory of victory. They didn't have this victory attached to their tribe's name. That's pride. Pride got in the, in the way right there, okay? Gideon had done what he was told, so really, the Ephraimites' uh, claims were groundless. There was nothing that they could really stand on. But still, jealousy, pride, the cry of victory attached to their name was too much. They wanted that glory, those glory points, right? But I love this because they tell, they tell Gideon off. Why do you treat us this way? You're such a jerk, Gideon. We want one of those glory points. And Gideon's answer in verse 2 is kind of modest. It's a good answer, honestly. Uh, it's calm, it's collected, it's self-assured in the, in the midst of something that could have been very stressful. And it's basically saying, hey, I'm not going to look at my own glory and my own status. I'm going to look at what you've done. And it's actually a really good way of looking after people, right? Someone comes up to you and goes, oh, I'm just having such a bad day. I've only managed to do this and see how good you are. And you go, yeah, but you're good too, man. And it's like that encouragement, right? And it's what he does here. What have I done now in comparison of you? Well, you're saying what I did was so great. What about you guys? You guys are so good. Look at you with your bunch of little pal, man. And it's funny because it's like the way he treats them there is encouraging a little child. Go on, try a little bit harder. Go on, you're doing so great. Good job. You went potty on the potty. Good job. Right? And it's that. It's that simple of, a, of an encouragement. That's what Gideon does. It's funny, though. So, uh, funny verse for you to think about in this state, in this uh, situation here. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 tells us charity or love suffers long and is kind. Charity envies not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. We're not called to be envious. We're not called to be jealous of others, but to act in love. What the people of Ephraim are doing here are they're acting all about how important they are, not about the whole tribe of Israel. They're thinking about our little tribe of Ephraim inside the body needs to be the one that's glorified. Actually, we're called to love each other, to treat each other well. And, and what Gideon's doing here is trying to focus on the fact that don't focus on the glory points. Focus on what God, the bigger picture that God's doing here instead. I hope that kind of makes sense. But <clears throat> and when he says, what have I done in comparison of you? Gideon did not challenge the pride. Notice that. He didn't say, like, how dare you act, like, challenge me and talk to me this way. Instead, he kind of tried to smooth it over. I think that's a good way of thinking about it, right? He complimented them, gave them recognition they seemed to crave of what had just happened. But most importantly, he challenged them to get involved in the work of God that was at hand right there. His reply was a wise way to deal with the contention um, when there is work for the Lord to be done. But Basically, Gideon seems to have a continuing um, back and forth or controversy with the men of Ephraim. Um, he later on, we're going to read about that in verse 27, makes a ephod, which was a disservice to Israel. And, and basically, it seemed like it was a competitive attitude towards the tribe of Ephraim. Of like a, see how good I am, maybe, type of thing, if you read it that way. But it's interesting to think about all this stuff, okay? And it's interesting to think about um, what happens when people's hearts go away from what God's asking you to do. So think about that for a second. Um, we're going to look at verses 4 to 9. The sins of the other tribes, okay? Um, so Sukkoth there and Peniel, um, verses 4 through 9. Verse 4, it says that um, Gideon came to Jordan, passed over, and he and the 300 men that were with him faint yet pursuing them. Who are they pursuing? Can anyone remember? Gabriel. Is it the Midianites? Right, and then the kings right there, okay? Awesome, good job. So we can imagine how tired they are. Remember they snuck down in the middle of the night? They had the torches over, with the jars over the torches, they had their trumpets, and they smashed them, and they all blinding light, and, all, and they shouted, and everyone went crazy. And then there was a big battle, and then they fled. And then the Israelites were like, get them! Go! So they pursued after them. But they're tired. They fought hard and they pursued the enemy over a long distance. They were tired but were eager to pursue until the victory was done. We get tired working for God. We do. It happens. The human body will get tired. We will wear down. Our energy levels will go low. Praise God for coffee. 
okay. <laughs> but the difference is, working for God, you don't really tire. Unless you're working for yourself. That's the big difference here. You can work for God and be energized and be ready to go because you're working for a greater purpose here. When we work for ourselves, we wear down faster. It doesn't mean you're never going to wear down. It just means you have this purpose, this drive to do better. And that's kind of my understanding of it all as well. It doesn't mean there's not going to be any issues, but it does mean that we're doing it for a greater purpose. In verse 5, um, it says, uh, And to the men of Sukkoth, give, I pray thee, loaves of bread unto the people that follow me. Feed the people that follow me. Feed them. Look after them. And it's basically, we're looking at the tribe of Gad here, by the way. This is where this land is now. Um, I've got a, uh, a map, I think. Boom, right there. So, uh, we have the big, the big battle, 300, uh, 300 battles right here, and we ran all the way down here, the tribe of Ephraim has come over this way, Sukkoth, Pinael, right there, and then we're going to end in Karkor in a second, but we are here right now. He's yelling, getting yelled at, being like, you don't know this, dude, you've got the guy's heads in your hand, well you can't come get food then, meh, meh, meh. and that's where we are right now, okay? So they're having, having this conversation, <clears throat> and Gideon, because... Because he's fighting for a great purpose. He's not fighting for Gideon here, he's fighting for God. God who's told him to go and fight for Israel, right? He's given him his leadership. He has his common cause. So he's gone around with his authority to say, feed my people so we can keep doing this. Feed my people so we can pursue. Feed my people so we can push on. It's not a bad thing to ask. Hey, this is going to benefit you. <clears throat> feed my army and we can keep going, right? And it makes me laugh because the, 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 the amount of support he was asking for wasn't really that much. Give 300 people meal, a meal, some snack, some food, replenish their snacks, their victuals that they brought with them, you know, fill, fill up their water bottle and then be good to go. He asked for bread. He asked for water. They turned it down and said, you haven't got the head of the enemies in your hand yet. And he's like, I'm trying to get them. That's the whole point. They weren't having it. So give loads of bread. Give loaves of bread unto the people that follow me. And Gideon the cool uh, came to the people of the city of Sukkoth to support those who fought the battle. Notice that he's not asking for food for him. He doesn't say that. Don't, he doesn't say, feed me, feed me, I'm so desperate. He says, feed those that follow me. A good leader doesn't think about himself. A good leader makes sure his team is good first, and then he's good after. Because actually, if you can't look after those you're meant to be leading, there's a problem here. You're not going to look after yourself. You're not going to look after the standard of the team. It's all going to drop. So Gideon's here saying, feed the people. Feed them, and we can keep going. Feed them, and we can push on. They were basically, this tribe of Sukkoth were, were being called to support those who fought the battle. They weren't on the front lines. They were playing a supporting role here. What's up? I'm a little confused. Yeah. So is this tribe part of Israel or is, are they not? What do you think? They don't sound like it. Where'd they cross? The Jordan. Are they in the Trump promised land right now? No. Rewind back to Joshua. Who stayed and who left? Oh. These are the tribes that wanted to live on this side of the land. Yeah. You had tribes that wanted to live on this side of the land. That's why there's this contention here. Oh, you live in the promised land. Oh, this side's not that bad either. You know, everyone knows that grass is greener on the other side. They, they went to the other side and they chose to go back. They didn't want to live in their promised land. This is one of the tribes that we're talking about here. So the people of Sukkot and the people of uh, Peniel, and then we'll end up over here on Karkor. Are they not counted as part of the 12 then? What do you think? Are they, well, because it sounds like there's 12 that actually got, well, 11 that got their land. Yeah, and then one was like a land and inside that land. Share. Yeah. And then there's those three, so there's <clears throat> like 15, sort of? Well, they would have been included, right? They would have been included if they had stayed this side. Yeah. But they chose not. There was the ones, remember mm -hmm. when Joshua put up the call, and then those, um, what do they call it, men of arms, uh, uh, men of valor, mm -hmm. came across and they fought the battles and they brought up the numbers and they had all those battles and they said, oh, all the fighting's done now. We're out. And Joshua said, that's what you said. You said you'd be here for the fight, and then you left. Thanks for the fight. Thanks for supporting. So it's, it's a confusing thing, because you think these guys would have been involved in this whole plan the whole way through, but they chose to not be even part of Israel's situation across the river. 
doesn't mean they weren't part of Israel, you know, but technically they're not part of the promised land. So, does that make sense? Yeah. You sure? Mm-hmm. Anything extra to add to that, Scott? I think you got it. I mean, they were a part of the tribe. They're just some of the people in the tribes that got their land in the promised land just decided not to go with their whole tribe. They just stayed behind. They like they said the grass over here is nice, the water's good. We don't need our promised land over there. We'll just hang here. Yeah. There you go. So Gideon's call to these guys is basically saying, "You don't need to fight. We'll fight. You just need to feed us. You just need to feed us. Here's our plan, our purpose. We just need the fuel to keep going here." Okay, we get to verse six and you get that answer here as well, because he basically, Gideon saying, I'm pursuing these guys, and their answer to that are, is, are the hands of Zeba and Zamuna in your hands? Are they there? Have you captured them, basically? Are you holding them right now? Because if you're not, it's not good enough. That's pretty, that's pretty tough. That's like, the standard is here, and you're like, well, how do I get to here? Because I'm down here. You better get there. Well, I'm trying to, but you need to help me a little bit. No, be there first. Got to be this cool to ride the roller coaster. It's kind of tough. So instead of help, the people of Sukkoth and Pinio had an excuse. They didn't want to support Israel in the fight until the battle was already won. It's kind of weird, right? It's a little bit backwards. Um, have you won yet? You want our bread, but you haven't finished the task? A little bit of kind of a taunt, a little bit of a, a weird way to approach this. But it shows you the heart that they didn't think that Gideon was able to get the victory. Why would I waste my bread on this? Because you're not going to get it done anyway. Why would I do that? Waste of bread. And we can suppose that this was discouraging for Gideon. I know he's fighting the battle. You can kind of think that would be. I'm hungry, I'm tired, I've been running for a long time, chasing after these guys. Now you're not going to feed me. But they didn't ask the people of uh, Sukhoff and Pinion to fight on the front lines only to support them. But they were unwilling, they made excuses. The thing we need to think about is when we set out to do the Lord's work, often the resistance that we face is from people who we thought were friendly. When we do God's work, it can get real discouraging. Don't fall for it. Don't don't be held back from that. Gideon pushes on. Verse 7, Gideon's answer to them, When the Lord has delivered, when I come back in peace, because the war is going to be over, I'm going to tear down this tower. I'm going to wreck your house. It's pretty aggressive, but it's fantastic. And I love it because he says, when the Lord has delivered, when the Lord's delivered and when I come back in peace, what is war? It's chaos. It is not peaceful. He's saying when it's settled, when it's done, when everything's over, I'm going to come back and I'm going to tear down this tower. I'm going to tear it down. With or without the help of the people of Sukkoth and Venial, Gideon knew that he would win the battle, <clears throat> but then he vows to make take revenge on the cities that refused to help him. And he says, you're going to tear your flesh with the thorns and with briars, prickly shrubs or wild roses kind of thorns type of thing, you know? You ever stuck out your hand in a rose bush and you pull it out and you've got scratches everywhere? Using that on the whole body. Cruel torture, basically. Um, <clears throat> captives um, back in the ancient times. Uh, would have thorns or briars placed over them and then something heavy pushed on top of them and then they'd get pulled, pulled, pulled and it would scar and it would rip. Think like Jesus with the crown of thorns, what do they do? They pushed it into his head. That's the same effect here. It's something that they still did with the Roman times. So it seems harsh, it seems harsh, but Gideon right now, he's a man at war. He's been called to do this. And in the process of fighting, there are no soft words here. You're on my team or you're not? Are you on God's team or are you not? I'm fighting for God here. Are you on his team? It's kind of a simple question. Verse 8, he went up to, uh, to Pino, Pino right here, and spake to them as well, the neighboring city, the territory of Gad. And we can read more about the location of this, um, Genesis 32, 30 and 31. Has Jacob named the place that he saw God face to face? And he was preserved. That's why that has this place, a name right here. So it's a famous spot. Jacob saw God's face and was preserved. That's pretty incredible. In verse 9, he says the same thing. Feed my people, feed my men. They answered the same. And instead, he just said, okay, fine. You're going to get the same. You're going to get the same as them. 
You doubt me? You doubt what God's saying? You gonna do the same thing? That's what's gonna happen. You're gonna get treated the same way. Which gets us to section two, verses 10 to 27. So now Zeba and Zalmunna were in Karkor and their hosts with them, about 15,000 men, all that were left of the hosts of the children of the east. For there fell 120,000 men at Jerusalem. And Gideon went up by the way of them that dwelt in the tents of the east of Noba and Jog Beha, and smote the host, for the host was secure. And when Zebra and Zalmunna fled, he pursued after them and took the two kings of Midian, Zebra and Zalmunna, and discomfited all the host. And Gideon, the son of Joash, returned from, from battle before the sun was up and caught a young man from the men of Sukkoth and inquired of him and he described unto them the princes of Sukkoth and the elders there, even threescore and seventeen men. And he came unto the men of Sukkoth and said, Behold, Zebra and Zalmunna, with whom ye did upbraid me, saying, Are they the hands of Zebra and Zalmunna now in thine hand, that we should give bread unto thy men that are weary? And he took the elders of the city and the fawns of the wilderness and briars, and with them he taught the men of Sukkoth. And he beat down the tower of Penuel and slew the men of the city. Then said he unto Zebra and Zalmunna, What manner of men were they that whom you slew at Tabor? And they answered, As thou art, so were they. Each one resembled the children of a king. And he said, They were my brethren, even the sons of my mother. As the Lord liveth, if ye have saved them alive, I would not slay you. And he said unto Jake Jetha, his <clears throat> firstborn, up and slay them. But the youth drew not his sword, for he feared, because he was yet a youth. Then Zeba and Zalmunna said, Rise thou and fall upon us. For as it is that the man is, so is his strength. And Gideon arose and slew Zeba and Zalmunna, and took away the ornaments that were on, his camel, on their camel's necks. Then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you, the Lord shall rule over you. And Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you that, you, that you would give me every man the earrings of his prey, for they had golden earrings, because they were Ishmaelites. And they answered, We will willingly give them. And they spread a garment, and did cast there in every man the earrings of his prey. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was a thousand and seven hundred shekels of gold. Beside ornaments and collars and purple raiment was on the kings of Midian, and beside the chains that were about the camel's necks. Verse 27, And Gideon made an ephod thereof, and put it in his city, even an offerer. And all Israel went thither, whoring after it, which thing became a snare unto Gideon and to his house. So, again, lots of things to think about here, okay? We're going to get to see uh, Karkor. This is where the Midianites' army is all camped out and ready to go. They're, they're tired. We can see that their numbers are depleted, down to 15,000 left from 135. They've taken a butt with them. They've taken the butt weapon and basically it, they, they've ran. They've ran all the way. They're tired. They found Karkor and it, they're going to sleep there now. Um, so <clears throat> Gideon went up, verse, uh, verse 11 here. Gideon went up the way that dwelt in tents of the east. Um, Gideon tracked them down across the mountains, across the northeast of Jabbat, and they came across them resting unexpectedly in this nomadic tribe area in Karkor. And he attacked the army when the camp felt secure. That's the brutal part here, right? They must have got there and they're like, okay, put up the defenses, get the watches started. We need to rest, we need to feel good, we need. And they're like, oh, this place, you know, we're, we're good here, man, we're good. And then Gideon pops his head up over the side and he's like, go attack! And then just takes him. And just takes him. So Gideon, continuing in the boldness of the Lord, led a courageous surprise attack. This wasn't the same as the 300 attack in the vast army back in Judges 712, but it was still a small army against a much larger army, okay? In verse 12, we can read that a third conflict took part here, okay? Um, when Zebra and Zamuna fled, he pursued after them and took the two kings of Midian, Zebra and Zamuna, and discomfited all the host. That discomfited again, we, talk, we talked about a few times how God does that sometimes confuses, turns them on themselves, makes people feel uncomfortable, that type of thing. But what happens is Gideon's arrival at the camp took the enemies by surprise and the conquest was completed. He pursued them and basically routed 
the whole army. This shows persistence. Just keep swimming, just keep going, just keep going, right? He fought until the battle was won and he went after the leaders of the opposition, even when everyone else told him it wasn't gonna happen, even when he's been discouraged. And verse 13 to 3, 17, Gideon repays those people that said, nah, not gonna do it. Sukkoth and Pinion, okay? So verse 13, Gideon returned before the sun was up. He got this done and was back to Sukkoth before they could even think about it. Before the sun was up. So when you think about it, like, that tells me there's not been much time here. Since the night went down in the second watch, they had the big fight when they dropped their vases and the torches were lit. They had the massive fight there and then you ran down the river and they've been on them the whole time. This has been pretty fast. Gideon, verse 14, catches a young man, questions him about the people in charge. He's in charge of Sukkoth here. Seventy princes of elders were, uh, named, were written down. These were the ones who had denied bread to his men and taunted him about the task at hand. Okay. Verse 15, he came to the men of Sukkoth and said, basically, you didn't want to help me? You want to help my army? Victory was assured. You didn't want to help me. And now there is victory. Now I'm going to have to, now I'm going to, have to punish you. Do I get my bread now? Do I get my bread now? Look, I look at whose hands I'm holding. Do I get it now, huh? It's kind of funny, right? I like that part. But... Verse 16, he took the elders of the sea and fawns of the wilderness and briars, and he taught them. What does that mean? Do you think he sat down and gave them a little nature lesson? Like, look at the thorns. Don't touch these. These are sharp. Is that what they're saying here, that he taught them? What do you think? Anyone? He taught them a lesson, right? He whipped them. He beat them. There was stuff going on here. In this instance, I kind of think like he publicly punished the leaders to show them this is why I said what I said, this is what I was going to do. So this public rebuke that happened in front of people. The refusal of the food for his soldiers, they had committed a crime as well as an act of inhumanity, really. And because of that, they were subjected to this horrible punishment. They, didn't, they weren't supporting what God was doing. They went against the Lord, obeyed against his plan. They went against God's leader, the judge Gideon, who had been appointed. That's the crime here as well. And then the inhumane act of saying, we're hungry. Remember we talked about that? Even the dude that went and hid in the tent? Give me some water, give me some bread. Here's some milk, here's some food. Okay, now you keep watching, you look after me. That was like a law back then. It was an inhumane act to turn people who were hungry away, but they did. So they got a double punishment right there of, getting taught a lesson right in front of their people, getting slapped around by Gideon. Verse 17 says, he tore down the tower of Penuel and killed the men of the city. And this text uh, doesn't really make it clear, but we suppose there was a justification for this severe penalty of like killing everyone, right? Um, perhaps the people of, uh, perhaps is a strong word here, okay? Perhaps they were supporters of the Midianites, Maybe they were traitors. Maybe there was something against them that was stopping them from supporting Gideon. <clears throat> Who knows? The fact is, uh, the people, are, the men of Sukkoth has, has more written about them. So you can only say perhaps, because I don't want to put words in where it's not written. Make sense? Um, maybe go down a rabbit hole. Maybe check out Pinuel, because actually I did. And it can take you down some really cool spots. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And that, check out 1 Kings 12, 25, if you want to look at a reference to that as well. So, uh, 1 Kings 12, 25. Uh, verse 18 to 21, uh, Gideon basically repays, repays the two Midianite kings now, okay? Verse 18, the kings of Midian were questioned, punished for their horrible times over the seven years of lawless occupation. You've been in charge, this is what you've done with it. And now they're facing their punishment. They had killed all the children who resembled the king. Children would get great beauty, it says, with a majestic look even, and they were killed for that. People who belonged to the king. This, this could be taken two different ways, right? I don't know if you, can, uh, if you guys think about this or not. But he said, what manner of men were they that you slew of Tabor? And they answered, as thou art, so they were. Each one resembled the children of a king. A king. What happens to Christians all over the world? It's persecution. Why? Because we're following the king. Because we're following King Jesus. I took it that way, and I also thought anyone who was in the family line of this king 
wipe out why because you take out the people who are going to bleed next you stop that family tree you cut it dead that's what he's doing and that's what these kings are doing they're taking care of their future generations with every single swing of the sword that's the, that's what they're doing there so verse 19 Gideon says they were my brothers the sons of my mother apparently these two Midianite kings were responsible for the death of Gideon's brothers Gideon wanted to make this known and confessed before he executed these kings. Confess your crimes. Let me know that you did it. Own up to what you've done. Right, that's why we have courts nowadays, so that people get, get justice in those ways. Now he's just asking. And think about back in those times as well. Polygamy was a thing. <clears throat> Husbands had many wives. So he could have had a lot of different brothers. Who knows? Verse 20, um, Gideon basically says now to his firstborn, Jether, he says, get up. Get up, Jaffa, pick up your sword. You're going to slay these guys. You're going to kill them. It's your job now, big man. Come on. Step on up. Home run. Basically, he's saying to Jaffa, I'm trying to put honor on your name. I'm trying to big up your name here. Because if you kill these kings, that's on your resume. Jaffa, killer of Midianite kings. Conqueror of Midianite kings. Jaffa, the one who slayed the Midianite kings. It's not bad for a, a, a father to do for their son, right? It's setting them up to be this big time player. And you, in Joshua, the book of Joshua, we can read about the blood avenger. Can you remember that? I think it was like chapter 19 or something like that, when you had those cities that would, would be safe havens. But the blood avenger was the person um, who was selected, was meant to be the same rank as the person they were going to slay. So in this situation, you can't have a young kid who says he's before a youth killing kings that's not what's meant to happen a king was meant to kill them that was the rule that was the law that was set out so the young man declines and verse 21 we can kind of see zebra and zalmuna when i read it the first time i thought man they're mocking this kid come on little man get up and kill us come on and maybe i was reading it more in a sense of like joking around and taunting because that's what i thought it meant i think really they encouraged their executioner so that their time would just come that their time would be done because they, they have been put through bad stuff already. But Jephthah declined Gideon. Jephthah declined them. So Gideon stood up and was like, all right, I'm doing it. <laughs> Did it. Rose up and he slew them both, taking away the ornaments from around their camel's necks. Okay. Um, this is a funny thing. Um, we're going to, we're going to, I'm going to get some pictures up here of, of the, the, the camels in a second, I think. Um, actually, no, I'll do it now. Boom. These camels um, would be clothed in certain colors and they'd have uh, jewelry draped around their necks. You can see here, these are, this is a war patrol. People were using this in the World War times and everything like that, camels to cross deserts and stuff. And it's kind of crazy, but that's what they would do. So they had these camels and you remember they were outnumbering everyone. Numbers of the sand of the sea. You couldn't count the amount of camels these guys had. But they were dressed up to the nines. They had these gold, they had their ears, camels of ears piercings, royal robes cloaked over them, all these things. And you're thinking, man, these camels are better dressed than half the people I know. <laughs> right? They're camels. But the point is, he took the ornaments from around their necks. Why? Because it's like a prize. Because it's a prize, okay? I'm gonna jump back here. Um, stay, stay in my place. But Israel verses 22 to 23 um, asked Gideon to be king. Be king. Rule over us. And the desire for a human king over Israel started early. They've always wanted someone to represent them. You've got Moses, you've got Joshua, you've got all the different judges, you've got the cry of, of their hearts of we just need someone to lead us. Hundreds of years later, in the days of Samuel the prophet and judge, God gave Israel the king they actually asked for. But the desire of Israel to have a ruler over them, they wanted this judge to be elevated higher. He can't just be a judge, he should be king. And not only should you be a king, you should establish a dynasty. Your son should be king after you. And then your son's son, and you know what happens after that? You kind of get the English empire. You have the same royal family being in charge for a very, 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 very long time, and it looks kind of awkward. So you go, what? Why are you here again? And you go, oh, always have been. Got to keep me there for a reason, right? But Gideon's response is the best. Verse 23, he says, I will not, I will not rule over you. Neither shall my son rule over you. 
the Lord shall rule over you. This is a great response from Gideon. He understood uh, that it was not his place to take the throne, that God should have the throne. Gideon gave the right answer when he said he didn't want to be king, yet in the rest of the chapter, he kind of acted like one. That's the, this is the part where it kind of declines. He did a really good job of being like, no, actually, I'm not going to be king. And then he came back and was like, I might be king. I might be king. I might act like a king, you know? It's always it's easier to talk about humility and service to God than to actually live it. And Gideon's done a great job of serving and talking and, and walking the walk, right? But even he still falls down. Gideon would judge and stay as a judge, but the Lord alone was king of Israel. And that's where it should be. Verses 24 to 26, Gideon gathers a fortune, <laughs> a fortune of swag, okay? Verse 24, Gideon desires a request of you, that each of you will give me earrings from this plunder, because they were people of Ishmael, they were Ishmaelites, they had gold earrings. And this doesn't seem like much to ask for, but when you think about 135,000 people, and they all have earrings, and you go, I just want an earring. That's 135,000 earrings, okay, made of gold. That's why this is a big deal. So. It doesn't seem like much to ask, but when you put it all together, nowadays, when you, you pull it all together, that's like 50 pounds of gold. All brought together, 22 kilograms. What's that? Why would they wear gold earrings? Because of vanity. Because mm. of glory. How will you be remembered? We're the people who wear gold. We're the people who dress like royalty. We're the Ishmaelites. You'll know who we are when we come and attack. It emphasize the earrings also as a ring oh. structure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, if you're a higher ranking guy, you have bigger, more. So it's more of a way up. symbol. Mm -hmm. Fancy ones, not so fancy ones. Mm -hmm. Clearly, I am <laughs> in a higher structure than you guys. You're not gold. Hey, man. <laughs> Verse 25 the response from these guys of him just asking for this earring. So, of course. Of course. I will, we will give you them. We will willingly give you them. The people were happy to give this, and it's hard to say that Gideon didn't deserve something, or the leadership that he's just done. Um, but at the same time, it now lifts him higher than all those people around him. Good leaders stay at the level of the people they lead. Once you have a leader that elevates, and is like, I am better than you, look at my Ferrari out in the church parking lot, people who are gonna pull in and go, the pastor's got a Ferrari? Well, I'm driving my, you know, crummy little car over here. They're driving a Ferrari and they're asking for more offerings. That can make things awkward, right? At this moment, that's kind of what Gideon's done. I'm asking for gold. Give me gold. General rule of thumb is that Christian leaders who make their living from the gifts of people, from of God's people, should live at the level of their own people. Not below or above. It should be, you should be right there. Um, if you go to a church, that is not the case. If your lead pastor's flying around in a their own plane or something like that. Maybe question it, you know. Um, the Midianites were known for wearing pearls and gold. And in the war here, an immense amount of valuable goods had fallen into the hands of the Israelite soldiers. They done good for plunder. They're all good right now. In verse 26, uh, the severe weight of this gold, 1,700 shackles of gold, besides the ornaments and collars. These ornaments were crescent-like plaques that would wrap round the camel's neck. Um, and they were tied around the neck, so, and they would glisten in the sun. Think about that. When these camels came over the, the crest of the hill and the sun hit it, you would just see this shine. And it makes it look like there's more. Like it's a real play of like image and understanding of like how many people you're up against. I can't quite see. It's quite a lot. These are all games that people played in war, and it worked. It worked, right? Um, it's kind of what the Romans used to do when they do their turtle formation. You'd see that row, and you'd see this row, you wouldn't know how many were behind them. And that was such a good way of doing stuff, you know? You'd be like, oh man, there's only, I gotta see 30 shields, it's fine. But like inside those 30 shields, there's 100 people, another 90 people walking with them. It was just a way to do it. So the camera was wearing that, it was a reflection, it was a status thing, it was a wealth thing, it was a glory thing. Who were you slain by? We were slain by these people who wore gold. They wiped us completely out. That's the only thing I saw. Stories were told of these Ishmaelites who did this. It's pretty epic. And then they die. 
So there you go. And the camels were robbed. <laughs> so <laughs> the collars were like earrings uh, with, uh, with gold and pearls and the color purple that they'd taken off as well, symbolizing the royal color. These animals had this amazing like clothes to wear, basically they were decked out. They were decked out. Verse 27, Gideon uses the riches he received um, and, this, and builds this uh, kind of weird um, leadership and role into, he turns it from like godly leadership into like idolatry. It's a sad way to go out. Because what, remember right at the very start, he like hucked down that altar, destroyed the whole orchard and everything like that, wrecked all those trees that were resembling other gods. And then it's wrapped around full circle of him following and following and pursuing and pursuing. And right at the end, you go, you're almost there, Gideon. Oh man, you too? And it's just like the cycle of Israel. And they did wrong in the sight of the Lord. And Gideon fighting hard, doing the right thing until he did wrong in the sight of the Lord. He made an ephod, an ephod, and set it up in the city. What's an ephod? Anyone got any ideas? Go for it. I just looked it up. It's a priestly, like, mm -hmm. chest plate. Yeah, so Exodus 28 talks all about the priestly ones that they would wear back then, okay? Um, it's weird because he set it up. He didn't wear it. He was just like, I'm just going to put this right here. Oh! Shining bar, everyone can see it. And maybe he thought, this is just going to help everyone remember. Remember the battles, remember what happened. Or maybe he set it up and was like, this will remember, they'll remember me. Or maybe they, they'll remember how good I was when I got this plunder and did this. But at the time, the tabernacle, the, t the center of worship for Israel was at Shiloh in the territory of Ephraim. Okay, that's the big deal here. The center of worship for Israel was at Ephraim. The Ephraimites were the ones that were not happy with him. So now he set up this, this place here, almost as maybe a competitiveness. Come here instead. Who knows? By the way, an ephod was a vest worn by the high priests. Being solid gold, we're not sure if it was actually worn or if it was just looked at. I can't imagine the weight of that thing. That would have been crazy. And maybe not made to be worshipped, but because it was made and made of gold, it became a snare <coughs> and perverted the house of Gideon. And all Israel, all of them went whoring after it again. The people of Israel enjoyed this idolatrous worship. This beautiful and expensive ephod became a snare once again to Gideon, his family, and all of Israel. I think that's incredible because I think you see this time and time again. You really do. It keeps wrapping around. It's, it's crazy, but that's just something that people get ensnared by. Section 3, 28 through 35. Um, Midian subdued and Gideon dies. Gideon dies. 28 through 35. Thus was Midian subdued before the children of Israel, so more, that they lifted up their heads no more. And the country was in quietness 40 years in the days of Gideon. And Drubal, the son of Joash, went and dwelt in his own house. Gideon had three score and ten sons of his body begotten, for he had many wives. And his concubine was at Shechem, and she also bare him a son whose name he called Abimelech. And Gideon, the son of Joash, died in a good old age, and he was buried in the sepulchre of Joash, his father, in Ophrah, in Abizarites. And it came to pass, as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel turned again and went a whoring after Balaam, and made Baal Bereth their god. And the children of Israel remembered not the Lord their God, who had delivered them out of the hands of all their enemies on either side. Neither showed they kindness to the house of Jerubal, namely Gideon, according to all the goodness which he had showed unto Israel. So, verses 28 to 30, Gideon assumes this kind of kingly role without being king, okay? Verses 28, we find out that Midian was subdued, conquered, defeated. They were defeated before the children of God, and the country was quiet was quiet. There was rest for 40 years in the days of Gideon. And regarding the security of the nation, Gideon's role as a judge was a success. As a judge, he succeeded because there was now peace again. But it ended in spiritual favor. It didn't point them back to God. It pointed them to somewhere else. And that's where it went down for, you know? Verse 29, Gideon went and he dwelt in his own house. It's nice to have rest, right? Verse 30, we find out that he has many wives. Gideon had lots of sons because Gideon had lots of wives, okay? This is a way to express wealth. Kings would have lots of, of, of wives and kids. 
position, status, and the clear ability to be able to provide for all those people as well. The Old Testament, funny thing for you here, the Old Testament never directly condemns polygamy, never directly condemns it. But in the New Testament, it does. Matthew 19, 4 to 6, 1 Timothy 3, 2. But the Old Testament shows the bitter fruit, the bad fruit of polygamy, right? The stories of polygamous families in the Old Testament, such as Jacob or David, are stories filled with conflict and crisis. And now we're going to read about Gideon and Abimelech. Oh my goodness, Abimelech. Mm -hmm. Just saying, don't even. <laughs> it's a continuation of this sin that they're living in. Verses 31 and 32, Gideon assumes or kind of hopes for this uh, future role. Um, and he may, names his son Abimelech, which means my father, a king. Now, was Gideon a king? Did Gideon turn down the role of king? He did, right? So why is he calling his son Abimelech, which means my father, a king? Yeah. It's kind of awkward. Yeah. It's the kind of a name that the king would, um, would actually name his son to say, look at how good I am. Right? Seems that Gideon intended that his son would become leader of Israel after Gideon himself was gone. Verse 32, we read that Gideon dies at a good old age. Through his career, we see Gideon as a man who slipped from a great height of faith to basically a place of apostasy, a place of idolatry and rebellion against God. Successes, riches, and prominence basically brought him down. His status brought him down. It isn't enough for us to be begin well with God. We, we must continue to do well with God. We must continue to walk throughout our whole Christian life with God. Gideon, in all his later years, had to look back to see anything good that God had done because all the works that he had been involved in were in the past. Now he was looking forward and being like, well, I'm going to think about me now. Gideon did a great thing for God, fought for him, defended him, and knew him. However, in the end... We've got to remember how Gideon ends. He forgot God, he went for the ephod instead, and wanted, wanted that position of power instead. Verse 33 to 35, Gideon, after Gideon's dying, Israel rebels and makes a covenant with Baal. Verse 33, it says, as soon as Gideon's coffin, he's gone, as soon as that's happened, they play, they play the game with the harlot with the balls again, right? In a sense, Israel served the memory of Gideon well, especially the Gideon of his later years. By serving Baal, Israel said what really matters here is money and success. Remember, Baal was all about the harvest, all about good crops, all about wealthy living instead of God who gives you real life. And made Baal Bereth their God. The name Baal Bereth means Baal of the covenant. The Israelites sadly regarded Baal as their covenant God. Why is that a big deal? Why is that a big deal? Because they had the real God making a covenant right at the very beginning, saying, I'll bring you out of slavery into the promised land. I'll bring you from death into life. I'll look after you. I'll be with you. I will be your God and you will be my people. That covenant. And now they're saying, actually, we want good crops. See ya. We're going to choose this kind instead. So you see this changing here. And the children of Israel, in verse 34, forgot God. They forgot all he had done, all they had all they'd gone through, and they forgot about him. And in verse 35, they forgot all that Gideon had done as well for Israel. Sad times. And you see again Israel fall further and further and further away from God. That's Judges verse, chapter 8 right there. End on that nice note. I've got three final thoughts for you. First one is kind of a funny one, but just keep swimming. The one thing I loved about Gideon here is that he kept going. He kept pursuing. He kept going after those Midianites until the task was fulfilled. The best part about Gideon here was his faithfulness to see the job done. Forget about the part afterwards, sorry. No, 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 no. But do not allow fatigue or lack of support or lack of bread to slow you down. When you have a task from God, just keep going there will be jealousy there will be issues of pride there will be hurdles left right and center because people do not want you to succeed if they're not involved we want part of the glory too but 
just keep going. If it's what God's asked you to do, it is important enough to keep pursuing it. Okay? Second one here, keep your eyes on Christ. The second we allow other things to sneak in, we allow the enemy to get a foothold. Gideon was a faithful man, filled with the Spirit, right? We read that in Judges 7. How did he get his leadership? Because he was filled with the Spirit. He had God. He knew God. He had the Spirit of God inside of him. He was given that position from God. He was anointed. He was powered by the Holy Spirit. He was ready to go. But as soon as he went, that gold looks pretty nice. That gold looks pretty nice. There it is. There's the opening. And the enemy came in and that's where I'm gonna get you. Your greed, your lust, your desire to be a king when you know you shouldn't be king. Your desire to have this instead of that when you know you shouldn't have those things. Don't let the enemy have a foothold. What's the, what's the desire of your heart? If there's one area that you think, ah, I just really want money. I really want money. I really want that big house. I really want the brand new, the brand new iPhone. I really want the best car. I really want the, what is it? Don't let the enemy have a foot. Don't pretend it's not there. We all have them, okay? We all do. Be honest about it. Talk to God about it. Don't let this become an ethod for you where you're gonna take your eyes off of God and look somewhere else. When we should be here, we'll be looking over here. That's what the enemy wants. Don't take your eyes off the prize. Don't take your eyes off Christ. Final one here, how are you gonna finish the race? Gideon, man of faith. Hebrews tells us that, remember that what I said in chapter seven? He remembered as a man of faith, a man of faith. But we have to remember how it ends. The start is good, really good. The middle is great, really great. The end is poor, really poor. And it went, boop, 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 boo. How are you going to finish? I talked about it last week when I said, when I said about what's going to be written on your tombstone. And it was, you know, pretty grim to think about it. You don't want to think about death. You guys are all teenagers. You've got plenty of years in front of you. You better do, all right? Don't let me outlive you. The point is, how are you going to finish? Are you going to finish this race running for Jesus? Or are you going to finish this race exhausted on the floor because you were looking at your own things instead? Are you going to finish this race running strong in love with Christ? Or are you going to look elsewhere being pulled this way and that way by the enemy? How you finish is just as important as how you start and how you continue on. How are you going to finish the race? Really important. Gideon, sadly, declined. Started well, got to the top, did really well in faith, and then declined. How are you going to finish?